seven day average total number of daily tests has dropped below 300,000 to 285,500. On Saturday, it went up to 421,000, 314,000 yesterday. So we're starting to get our cadence back in terms of daily tests, but there was a lag. There's certainly an impact associated with the holidays. And so I caution in terms of total case numbers that in terms of your consideration, the average case number numbers again around 37,845 is the number really to focus on. That said, the positivity rate at 12.4 percent has remained relatively stable over the last two-week period. You can see here on this chart 12.2 percent positivity rate two weeks ago on the 21st of December, 12.4 uh, percent in this latest reporting period ending yesterday. Hospitalizations have increased at 18 percent. That is a more modest modest growth rate than we've seen in the past. We have uh, foreshadowed this. We have socialized uh, based upon uh, our own um, planning and our own uh, modeling and expectation of a lull before a surge on top of the surge coming from case uh, rates and ultimately hospitalizations and ICUs associated with the holiday. So this is not where you hold your breath. Uh, it's good news, nonetheless, that we're seeing a modest reduction in the growth rate in hospitalizations. But I just remind you what you don't see on this slide and the subsequent ICU slide, which shows a 22% increase in emissions over the last 14 days is this reality. On hospitalizations, we've seen a seven-fold increase in just two months. On ICU admissions, we've seen a six-fold increase in just two months. So it shows what can happen in a very short period of time, a very condensed period of time, and that it goes to the urgency of not only this moment, but the urgency uh, that we have placed in anticipation of this surge and anticipation of the surge on top of the surge coming what we believe in the next number of days and weeks from the holiday season. Let's take a look at ICU capacity statewide, familiar slide, that 0% in Southern California, 0% in San Joaquin uh, Valley, again representing not the fact that there are no ICU beds just represents the fact we're now in our surge phase in our surge uh, strategy for ICU. Uh, I will identify an additional ICU capacity, 7.9 percent, around 8 percent in the Bay Area. You can see the greater Sacramento region um, of rain. 12.1 percent, been a little above 15 percent, a little below 15 percent, now 12.1 in Northern California. Uh, the one region in the state that has not been imposed upon as it relates to the stay-at-home order uh, remains uh, above two times above that 15% threshold that we've identified at 30%. Uh, the deaths, again, these numbers can be misleading from the weekend, and then you stack on top of that weekend collection and data uh, with holiday. Uh, and so take a look more, I think, closely at that seven-day average, 336 lives lost, families torn apart uh, because of this pandemic. Just put it in perspective, the last 14 days, close to 4,000 Californians have lost their lives. This is a deadly disease. This is a deadly pandemic. It remains more deadly today at any point in the history of this pandemic. So I want to put that in perspective, that 97 is deadly and that devastating as that may be. That number is substantially lower than that seven-day average. Just a reminder of the seriousness of purpose we all must have at this moment to mitigate the spread and the deadliness of this disease. As it relates to doing just that, we've been uh, deploying technical assistance teams all up and down the state of California. As you heard a few weeks back, we focused our energies on Los Los Angeles in particular. We're extending those technical assistance teams down there, Riverside, San Bernardino, and San Joaquin. We've also deployed teams. These teams, just as a reminder, are made up of our EMSA folks and OSHPED and Cal OES, that's Office of Emergency Service where I'm here today, and of course CDPH, California Department of Public Health. So these are the coordination teams focusing on decompression, meaning reducing a stress on certain uh, physical locations, space, equipment, supplies, the whole gambit, including oxygen and more on oxygen in a moment. 
You can see as well, latest tally, just shy of 1,300 state and federal staff been deployed, continue to work, including over this weekend, over the holidays, try to get more federal supports. And we are seeing some support in that space. We certainly look forward to more at the Department of Defense, HHS, and others. You can just see us, examples of some of the folks we're using, including now 144 CalGuard medical experts uh, that have been deployed at key locations across the state. Now back to the issue of oxygen and our oxygen strategy. Strategy. It's important to highlight this. It's gotten some attention, and I just wanted to give it a little bit more uh, focused attention here today and socialize those of you that may not be familiar with the issue of oxygen supply in the state. Uh, because of the strain, because of the stress down in Los Angeles in particular, and of course, San Joaquin Valley been placed upon the hospital system, we have organized, and I'll talk more about it, uh, a statewide oxygen strategy. We actually have a task force on oxygen that we put together. We stood up a week or so ago, but you can see the framework of our strategy is predicated on five fundamental um, uh, efforts, and most important being uh, just mitigation and awareness at this moment, particularly for those hospitals and facilities that are not necessarily focused on it. Uh, we are making sure that we're reaching out to every facility up and down the state of California uh, to caution around what's occurred in some parts of the state uh, and what is a preview of things that may come in other parts of the state. So we're sharing best practices, not just the information around this issue being of concern, but best practices for hospitals have already overcome these issues and providing resources. Those resources include technical assistance team. I referenced that state oxygen team that we put together. We also have OSHPOD, one of our state agencies working with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the best of the best. These guys have been with us since the beginning of this pandemic. Uh, they're part of our morning cadence of morning calls in terms of our logistics strategies. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the folks that are helping out with these alternative care facilities and technical assistance, uh, world-class group of folks. And they're looking at the capabilities within existing facilities throughout the state and looking at making enhancements. And they've done just that. Let's talk about that. The oxygen support and the support that the Army Corps has already provided has been example, then seven facilities, uh, five down in L.A., uh, two in San Bernardino, uh, a little bit of a typo on this chart. We also are uh, going to be sending uh, that team down to Fairview to help support those efforts. EMSA has been deployed uh, with, uh, today we'll be looking to uh, deploy them for refilling capacity in these uh, oxygen, for these oxygen tanks. And then these, uh, what we call DMSU uh, units. These are the medical support units. We have 42 of them across the state. They have oxygen that's components of those DMSUs and we're starting to repurpose those. And so we've got a logistics team logistics task force that's helping with that. They're also leasing mobile oxygen systems, uh, so we have the ability to do more rapid point, uh, deployment. One of the other strategies, and this is important to Dr. Galley and others, been working hard on this over the last number of days, is home oxygen support to, again, decompress, reduce the stress on the system, get people the support and the connection at home uh, to get the kind of oxygen that would allow them to recover uh, and allow us more uh, availability and more capacity within our existing facilities in terms of utilization, in terms of the stress on that capacity. And so we've been working with vendors and we've been working across the spectrum to create a framework of support uh, to help uh, with this strategy of decompression and ultimately uh, the strategy of mitigating the utilization of these systems that are leading to a series of issues which get more complicated as it relates to system pressure as it relates to the conversion uh, of the liquid into gas and icy conditions that occur. Again, too much information except to say uh, this is part of the larger strategy in terms of what the Army Corps is doing, but also what we're trying to uh, do by getting people to move into home environments and reduce the utilization of those oxygen systems, the larger systems. As it relates to the state procurement efforts, we've got 160 uh, units that have been deployed, or rather 106. We've got 160 uh, that are in our California medical stations that will look to redeploy. We talked about these EMSA stations, other stations. We're just looking at the panoply 
of oxygen support. That's in essence what this slide says. Panoply of supports across the spectrum and looking how we can utilize more flexibility uh, and broader distribution of these oxygen units all but down uh, the state, but particularly in these areas, San Joaquin Valley and Los Angeles, the larger Southern California region that are in particular need and are under particular stress. Uh, we also are looking uh, to order 400 of these oxygen concentrator units and uh, that has been done. We're looking forward to adding to the 200 or rather 423 uh, units that are already in our cache. We hope to get to 823. That's the stated new uh, goal, at least for the state. Uh, again, maybe too much information information, uh, but I thought, it, again, purpose always to share with you what's shared with me, try to do it in real time, just to update you on some of these efforts. Talk, talk about updates. Uh, we've got 90 people now in these alternative care sites. You're familiar, those of you who've tuned in, very familiar with these sites down at Imperial Valley College, the Sleep Chain Arena up here in Sacramento, Porterville and Fairview, and then the Palomar uh, alternative care site that now has in the San Diego region just taken in 10 patients, but 90 uh, total that are part of this alternative care system. I'll remind you, we have substantially more sites that have uh, been put into what we call warm status, other sites that are being stood up, which means they'll start to get operationalized. The outside time to operationalize these sites is about, um, well, it's usually about 48 to 72 hours. In some cases, you'll get into that fourth day, uh, but that's rare. So our ability to turn these on quickly, uh, uh, maintain, we're still in that position where we can turn these on quickly, subject to, again, the one thing, and that's staffing, staffing, staffing. Again, it's the most important issue. Facilities are one thing. Staffing is the thing that is the energy and focus. With that, our energy and focus has also gone to this notion of the light being at the end of the tunnel. And despite being in the tunnel, um, we recognize there's hope on the horizon. And with that, I wanna just update you briefly on the vaccines. A lot of attention, a lot of focus, a lot of stress, uh, a lot of uh, punditry in this vaccine space. But let me just update you briefly on what we are doing. You're gonna, you're gonna get updates consistently on this. And I'll remind you, a lot of this information is made available on the state site, the covid19.ca.gov website, covid19.ca.gov website. So you can go learn about all the details and nuances of our phased plan strategy, the tiers and sub tiers. I'll update you in a moment, but again, go to that site when you want more information. Just a brief update though, this week, I submit to the legislature a new budget for the next fiscal year. We are working with legislative leaders who have been magnificent about an early action strategy. And in particular, we are looking to get some early action clearly to support our efforts on vaccination distribution. Again, we're in phase 1A, healthcare workers and those seniors living in congregate facilities. As we expand to new bands, new phases, going from a group of about 3 million people to tens of millions of people. IT is gonna become more important, this end-to-end -end CalVax management system, getting that fully operationalized, which is very, very, it's moving along very, very well. Uh, we are very close to getting it to where we need it to be. All our logistics and commodities efforts and the dry ice that continues to be an issue uh, with not just Pfizer, but also storage and uh, cold needs as it relates to dry ice uh, for transportation and logistics purposes, even for Moderna. Public education campaign, just, you know, absence of a national public education campaign. Clearly the state needs to do more. We've given you some updates, seen some PSAs in a culturally competent way. Again, we gotta meet people where they are and that's underway, but not at the scale that we would like in terms of the social media and the peer-to-peer -peer work, working in partnership with community-based organizations, our organization we call Listos, building off the work we did with our census. But $300 million is proposed in that budget I'll talk more about that in detail on Friday, but I'm just giving you a preview of what's in that budget specifically for vaccinations. We are working aggressively to accelerate our pace. We've said this from day one, it's like a flywheel. First 10, 15 days, we're gonna slowly start building pace, gonna start building it, and you're gonna start seeing the rap more rapid distribution of this vaccine. I can assure you that. Now, that said, it's gone too slowly, I know, for many of us. 
all of us, I think, we want to see 100% of what's received immediately administered in people's arms. And so that's a challenge, a challenge across this country. It's a challenge, for that matter, around the rest of the world. But that's not an excuse. And so we're already working this last number of days to increase the number of distribution sites and, more importantly, to accelerate the efforts of who can distribute the vaccines, dental uh, uh, administration, so dentists administering the vaccine, the pharmacy techs, National Guard, more of our National Guard deployed to begin the distribution administration. Our pharmacy program, that's a partnership with CVS and Walgreens, and that's underway. We started that last week. We're encouraged by that. They're going to focus on SNFs skilled nursing facilities and assisted living and under co other congregate facilities. And then our partnerships, working with CMA and others and clinics, doctor partnerships up and down the spectrum. So more aggressive efforts in this space. And I'll talk to you more later this week about substantial increases in these efforts, meaning additional supports that we're putting in terms of the administration and the flexibility and the urgency of our distribution strategies. But here I'll just quickly update you on the total number of doses and then the next phase of planning. So we've received, the state actually has in its possession um, about 1.29 million doses. Uh, we've got 611,000 that are being shipped. They haven't arrived yet. You see the second doses are arriving this week. So those first doses, uh, you'll get those second doses for those that are queued up. Now, here's how many we've put into people's arms. 454,000, 1.29 and 454,000 doses administered. So we got work to do on this. We work through that holiday. And obviously, as we move into January, we want to see things accelerate and we want to things, see things go much faster. I can assure you. Uh, governors are talking to other governors, chiefs of staff to chiefs of staff, looking at logistics, sharing best practices, what's working, what's not working across the spectrum. And one recognizes you've got to be iterative, you've got to be flexible, uh, and you've got to have a sense of deep urgency. And I, I hear that from folks calling me directly, uh, people uh, that are expressing themselves very uh, forthrightly and understandably around their anxiety of when do I get these doses. So let's talk about that. As I said a moment ago, we are in phase one, which is healthcare care workers and long term care residents, again, congregate facilities, seniors. That's the current phase, about three million people, plus or minus. Phase one B is the phase that was discussed last week by our guidelines working group, and it has multiple tiers. Within each phase, there are multiple tiers, just as there is with phase 1A. Phase 1B, here are the tiers, the top tier, 75 and over, workers in education, so teachers. But what's the prioritization for teachers? Is it those that are doing in-person instruction or those that are doing distance learning? So that's the work that's being done, and by the way, that will all be updated very publicly on Wednesday. I'll get to that in a moment. But here's the tiers, 1B and that tier 1. You can see who we're prioritizing. Tier 1B, uh, or rather tier 2 and 1B, that moves from 65 uh, to 65 and over, not just 75 and over. And you can see the other sectors in terms of individuals and um, industries, logistics, industrial, residential, commercial facilities, services that uh, will be prioritized. Now, 1C will be updated and discussed, not signed off on this Wednesday, but will be discussed. That's the next phase, and that's 50 and over. And that's the phase I would likely be in. And then people with underlying medical conditions down to the age of 16. So that's the next phase. Phase 1B is about 8 million people. Phase 1A, about 3. Phase 1B, 8 million. By the way, that's plus or minus. Uh, and that will be, we'll land on that this Wednesday. So that number will get updated this Wednesday. I'm just giving you proximate numbers. And then 1C is this much larger cohort that includes, I imagine, many of you that may be tuning in. But speaking of tuning in, I encourage you to tune in uh, on the 6th, this Wednesday, 3 to 6 o'clock. This is on the covid19.ca.gov website. If you choose, that will, that will send you the, to the right place to tune in. And this is the Community Vaccine Advisory Committee. I'll remind you, 60 people. We put three committees together. We have a safety committee that we put together in the middle part of October. We partnered with Washington State, Oregon, and Nevada. 
They've signed off on Pfizer. They've signed off on Moderna, not only for efficacy, but safety. That was the eyes that we wanted to put on this in addition to the eyes of the federal government. We have this drafting guidelines work group. They've been meeting consistently, and that is a smaller cohort of people uh, than this community advisory committee of 60. That group is 16 people. They're the technocrats. They're sort of the experts, and they're providing their rationale, and that rationale is being reviewed with an equity lens with this community advisory committee, 3 o'clock to 6, presumably three hours. We'll see on the 6th this Wednesday, and they will also begin to socialize and roll out a little bit more information, not just locking in the tiers on 1B. They've already locked in uh, the broader cohorts. The tiers will be locked in. That will be done 1C uh, and talk about how we opera uh, operationalize better administrative processes as well. So it's worth taking a look. A lot of people are asking me about this, and I, there's no greater place to get a sense of really what's going on, this very transparent process. It's a very accountable process, but again, recognize the deep anxiety and need for urgency on all of this. And we are not going to require uh, a cadence once a week of understanding. We are going to socialize a deeper understanding of what we're doing um, uh, on a more consistent basis, I assure you. Speaking of updating you on our conditions on a more consistent basis, a new strain, this was brought up last week. Um, we brought up the fact that we have now detected. We do very comprehensive genomics testing in the state of California. I, I see some of the national news on this saying America doesn't do this. I, I, don't, I think it's a little misleading because as part of this country, California has been doing a lot of genomics testing, anywhere from five to 10,000 tests a week. Uh, just here, just again, proximate where I am, UCSF, partnership with CZ Biohub, been doing a lot of these genomic tests, looking for different strains pretty consistently. In Southern California, they've been doing the same. By definition, uh, four individuals in San Diego were identified with this UK, lazy pun, lazy way of describing it, UK strain, at least the strain that was identified first in the United Kingdom. One is now hospitalized. We also have two additional individuals that we identified in San Bernardino. We have all kinds of new genomics tests. I was hoping, um, I think they're coming later this afternoon, the results of those tests. Um, I was hoping to have an update for you. We imagine, uh, in fact, one should just anticipate uh, there'll be others identified uh, and we'll know more about this in real time. And hopefully it's late this afternoon, tomorrow, uh, we'll be able to update you more on some of the latest genomics testing that's been done to understand more comprehensively what the strain um, is, looks like and what it's doing. I'll get to that in a second, but just briefly remind you, we're contact tracing. Our disease investigation is very aggressive in this space in particular, and that, that's underway. And that's allowed us to understand a little bit more about those four individuals did they travel? Did they not travel? Are they in contact with someone who was traveling, um, et cetera? And so uh, as that information becomes um, available, uh, some of it already has been, uh, but as more information becomes available, we'll share it with you. Just to remind you, though, uh, this new strain, this new variant is more contagious, we believe, but not more severe in terms of its impact, in terms of your condition. Uh, and we do, yes, believe, and you've heard this, you've read it, and seen discussions, TV about this. CDC does believe the vaccines will protect the current available vaccines. We're getting good news. Hopefully Johnson & Johnson will join and other vaccine manufacturers will come into the queue uh, later this month, uh, including AstraZeneca, but that may be even later still for different reasons. Uh, CDC, though, believes will protect against this new strain. Just underscores, that's why I put this slide up, just underscores the importance of our preventative measures, particularly now with a strain that's more, more easily transmittable, meaning transferable, meaning you're more likely to get this strain. That's why it's more important to consider all the common sense things that you know well and I don't need to burden you with in terms of just distancing and social distancing, physical distancing and hygiene and all those things. 
All right, you've been watching a coronavirus update from Governor Gavin Newsom. Our coverage continues right now on CBS San Bay Area, streaming on KPIX.com. Governor Newsom says we are still waiting to see what an expected surge from the holidays will exactly look like. But as of now, still a grim picture in the state. 97 more people have died, bringing the seven-day average to 336. The governor says things are more deadly today than at any point in the history of the pandemic. Meanwhile, in a matter of two months, California is experiencing a seven-fold increase in hospitalizations. The governor also announcing that they're working on plans to ramp up vaccinations in the state. Again, more now on CBSN, Bay Area, KPIX.com.